Well, this is great. Let's get started here. And as you're joining, please let us know where you're from and your role in education. Also, if you have any questions for um, any of us on this panel or uh, for Jay himself, please go ahead and put that in the chat and that will be funneled to us. We are glad that you're joining joining us this afternoon. This is um, a, a webinar to support National News Literacy Week. It is focusing on lesson planning for your misinformation unit, UBD educator framework, Checkology, and other news literacy resources. So we are thrilled to have you here with us, joining us with special guest, Jay McTie. And as Pam said, we are giving away uh, his books, 10 of his books. Um, and so be sure to listen for that at the end. We will be giving 10 of them away and have them shipped to you. So people from all over the US joining us, which is fantastic because um, in this current day and age, the fight against misinformation and disinformation is more important than ever. And we see educators across the country using all of our programs, resources. Uh, and so we wanted to add another one to your toolbox. Uh, if you are brand new to NLP, let us know if this is the first time you have heard of the News Literacy Project, or um, if you maybe you've heard of us but haven't used any of our resources, uh, go ahead and drop that in the chat. We always love to see who our brand new educators are. Um, a little bit about NLP, we do have our founder and CEO on, Alan Miller, so make sure to say hello uh, to him, but Alan Miller founded NLP in 2008, and we are an education, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, the bulk of our time is spent um, designing and collaborating with educators to provide free resources and programs to support uh, your learning, not only in supporting critical thinking skills, helping students discern fact from fiction, understanding freedoms of the press, the First Amendment, um, but the last few years, we've also increased our resources for the public sector, which is great. It offers that transparency to support families who want to learn alongside their students. So again, we are founded in, in 2008, and we are happy to be sharing all of our resources and programs um, with you, but with a special emphasis today on the new framework that Pam, I know, has consulted Jay uh, McTie on frequently to make sure that we could add this resource to your toolbox, um, as well as a focus on essential questions. Something else I would love for you to drop in the chat, you know that we're giving away some of, of Jay McTie's books. Um, have you ever used backwards design in your unit or lesson planning? I um, would love to know if you use currently backwards design in your lesson planning. And uh, Jordan, when you see those comments in, coming in, if you will, will let us know um, what the consensus is for that UBD. Absolutely. Got a no, a yes, no, yes. Uh, someone's okay. used it before, but needs more help. Looks like we've got about half and half so far. Thanks to everybody for chiming in. That's great. Um, quickly, uh, you are joined by um, an NLP group right here. We have Jordan who was just sharing all of um, uh, the resources and the chat messages. And uh, we make up the network team with Kim Bowman who is also on here as well. You may have already had conversations with Kim because she is one that you directly communicate with when you are on Checkology in the Help Center. And she's our senior associate of user success. Um, Pam is uh, part of the education team and she has developed this framework with, with Jay. She is our senior manager of education and content. I'm Shaylin Farnsworth coming to you live from Florida. Yes, I am at FETC right now, but excited to celebrate National News Literacy Week, our annual event every January towards the end with this exclusive webinar, not only sharing our new framework, but also uh, 
um, uh, Jay McTie and his work with um, UBD. So uh, if you are unfamiliar with Jay, I know that his information is linked in our link tree, but he is an education and education leader, uh, author, um, a consultant, and he has so graciously partnered with us to help support this framework to add something to your toolbox. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a few questions here. Uh, to, to get everyone thinking about UBD and to understand kind of um, the creation of this framework. But I'm gonna start with Jay. It seemed like most people um, were half and half as Jordan said. Some people have used um, backwards design before, others have not. Um, so what is understanding by design and, and why should educators use it? Well, thanks Shailene and hello to everyone. Um, and before, before I answer, I, I just want to declare that I'm a huge fan of the News Literacy Project uh, and go way back, in fact, um, to the origin story. Uh, Alan Miller and I had lunch, I think it was in 2007, since he was in Bethesda and I was in Columbia, Maryland. And, and he w kind of was describing his, his vision for this. Um, and so it's a great joy to see the manifestation of this vision and the important work that NLP does. Um, so to your question, what is understanding by design? In a nutshell, it is a curriculum planning framework. Uh, and the key ideas of understanding by design are in fact in its title. The focus of this curriculum framework is teaching for understanding ultimately so students are equipped to transfer their, their learning. To say that we want to focus on understanding in no way um, suggests that we don't care about basic knowledge or basic skills. Clearly, those are foundational. But there's more to learning than just learning facts. And there's more to education than just developing the basics. They're foundational. For modern education, my contention is we should be preparing students to transfer, to be able to take what they've learned and apply it to new and even unfamiliar situations, because that's the nature of our world today. And yet, as we all know, the pandemic, which has been so impactful in our lives and, and so disruptive to the world, was not on many radar screens 24 months ago. And it's a sobering reminder of the world we're preparing for is unpredictable. Things are changing rapidly. The world is more interconnected, global, new opportunities and new challenges emerge. So rote learning of information that you can give back is an insufficient preparation for modern education. So in a nutshell, understanding by design proposes to prepare students to transfer, but you can't transfer something that you don't understand, right? If all you have is rote learning of facts, you can give back the facts, but you can't necessarily apply them. And so understanding enables transfer. Now, what do I mean by understanding? Focusing on quote, big ideas, both concepts as well as processes within the various disciplines and some that cut across disciplines like critical thinking, which is an underpinning of NLP. So there are things we want kids to come to understand um, and we identify those specifically uh, for our teaching, for student learning and for our assessments. Um, the by design part of our title refers, as you mentioned, to backward design. Backward design is not new, but it's proven to be an effective planning process for planning anything, but understanding by design puts it toward curriculum. Um, so it says, let's plan with the end in mind. If we're clear about what we want students to be able to do with their learning, transfer, and we thought about what they're going to need to understand in order to transfer that learning. And we've worked on the building blocks, the basic skills that are underneath it all. Those are the ends from which we plan backward. So it's understanding by design. That's it in a nutshell. That's great. And I love how you spoke about the interconnectedness between disciplines. It kind of launches into the next question um, and also of your uh, longstanding connection with NLP and, and um, Alan Miller. Um, so this is 
to you first, Jay, and then Pam, if you want to chime in, how do you see the topic of misinformation connecting to different disciplines? Well, it's a great question. I'll, I'll give a couple of thoughts. Um, thought number one is, what is a discipline? Well, let me answer that rhetoric, <laughs> somewhat rhetorical question. A discipline is not just an accretion of factual knowledge to be learned. A discipline refers to a disciplined way of thinking that is the basis for the knowledge that has accrued in the various disciplines. And you sometimes hear your teachers talking about, let's think like a historian or a journalist or a scientist. And, and so part of the essence of knowledge creation and ver verification comes to do what NLP is teaching, teaching people to critically appraise claims or theories, ask for evidence. Um, and it's through that disciplined process that the knowledge that we come now to know is in fact validated. And we've, we've cut out the misinformation, the crack, crack theories, or even the, the well-intentioned theories that didn't play out. So that's a long way of saying, I think we can actually approach that question epistemologically. In other words, as part of education, let's talk to students about the nature of knowledge, how it accrues, how we validate it, and how we separate misinformation from that which is actually verified. Um, one other quick point, if I may. Um, interestingly, four academic disciplines, English language arts, science, social studies, and uh, mathematics have one standard that cuts across all of them. And that standard refers to argumentation, the ability to uh, develop, support, and critique arguments is in those four standards. And when you unpack what is the nature of argumentation, well, this is NLP's territory, right? Argumentation is a structured process where there's a claim, there's reasons and supported by evidence. And so the standards are telling us we need to be teaching kids about argumentation, evaluating claims, looking for evidence, checking on and evaluating reasons. Um, and it's an epistemological move that plays out at least in those four disciplines. So those are a couple of thoughts for the, to your question. Thank you, Jay. I could listen to you every uh, for hours, and I'm sure Pam is, is is would agree with this. And, and I have a million more questions, but I'm going to stay on focus and topic here. Um, and Pam, I'm going to skip over your answer because I want to hear how did this framework <laughs> develop um, with Jay? What ignited that spark? And what do you think some easy entry points to this framework is? So I'm going to start with Pam, and then if Jay wants to add anything, sure. Um, so. The framework, you know, I, I developed the framework predominantly with um, resources that NLP had already had. It was just putting them all together in a concise document and a form that would be helpful for me creating resources at NLP, but also for educators who wanted to, to create their own curriculums, create their own units, to see where everything fits in. And I have had this book on my shelf for a long time and I used it when I taught at the college level. So I knew it was exactly what I needed to build um, our template for, the, for our framework. And I, even though this book is, is primarily for unit planning and, and ours is, is a framework more flexible, um, I still use the same tenets. And uh, I, I came into contact with Jay because our founder, Alan Miller, and Jay <laughs> have been connecting for years. And, and Jay is a big supporter, as you said, of NLP. And he graciously agreed to meet with us. And so I developed um, what I thought were, were good, uh, was a, a good preliminary design for stage one, stage two, and stage three. And then Jay looked at, it, looked at it and gave us feedback and revised. We met again until we, we finally have this finished final framework for teaching news literacy. And as uh, you can see on the screen, it is uh, made for educators, both, both uh, individual teachers who wanna create their own unit plans for districts who wanna create a vertical aligned curriculum. It could also be eventually used by you know, state, state ed departments who wanna create, develop 
lessons um, to address media and news literacy. It is, as, as Jay mentioned, a backward design. It's, it's three stages. The first stage is all about identifying your desired results. So transfer goals that Jay had, had referenced are those, those long-term accomplishments, the transfer. Um, so you know, a couple of them that we have would be students will be able to distinguish news from other types of information, develop, demonstrate a healthy skepticism towards information, identify credible information and sources. These are just a few long-term goals, right? That by, by the time they are, our students are adults and interacting in our democracy, this is what we want them to be able to do, to transfer these, this knowledge, these skills, these concepts into action. Um, the next part you want to think about in stage one would be your established goals and the news literacy, the news literacy project has five standards that we've identified that are that make up news literacy. Um, I'm not going to read everything here, but you can see it's about distinguishing information from other types of um, uh, news from different types of, of information like ads, um, understanding the role of a free press and the First Amendment. Uh, it's gonna be understanding what are the standards of quality journalism. You, do, you demonstrate increased critical habits of mind so that you can detect misinformation and faulty evidence. That would be that, that um, argumentation that Jay was, was talking about. And then our final standard, which is crucial, would be students express a sense of responsibility for the information they share and feel more empowered to be civically engaged because ultimately they have to be able to use that knowledge to participate. In, our, in the larger world. And then also in stage one, you're gonna be thinking about the meaning and acquisition. And this is typically what teachers, at least young, new, new teachers are gonna think of when they say, what, what, what do I have to teach? Those skills, those concepts, right? So when we talk about meaning, these are your concepts and then your essential questions that are thought provoking that um, help with the meaning um, for your, for, for your classes and acquisitions, those are gonna be your facts, what will students know and the skills. Um, so we have a whole bunch of, of skills that you can choose from and, and elements there in stage one. Those are the very first things you, you're gonna to wanna to be um, addressing when you think about what do I need to teach in terms of news literacy? And then, so stage one, then we go to stage two. And stage two is all about evidence. Evidence, um, and this will be with the performance tasks. So what assessment tasks will provide valid evidence of students' understanding and ability to transfer their, their learning? Oftentimes, the most, the most common you're gonna see is tests, right? But, but that's, that's other evidence. Performance tasks, we wanna be more authentic. They want them to be, um, students are, are actively using the skills and, and concepts in, in a creation. Um, and here's Jay's book that will be, um, giving away by the end, designing authentic performance tasks and projects. So you can get into how to design some. We have outlined a handful of suggested performance tasks for you um, that will correlate to our, our standards. And then the third stage, and this is what most people outside of education think education is, is just planning your lessons, right? This is what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's, it's thoughtful and it's, um, purposeful, right? You are going to figure out the types of goals you are addressing. What, what are you teaching for acquisition, meaning and transfer, and in what order? Um, we have outlined a number of learning events for you and, and provided resources with our 14 Checkology lessons and supplementary activities or supplementary resources to go along with those lessons. You'll notice that we have identified core for the, the the lessons that are really um, essential to meeting that standard. So if you don't have a whole 20 weeks to teach news literacy, but you have five, we would say we recommend using these lessons for sure and whatever else you want. Um, and in a nutshell, I guess that would be our, our framework overview. Jay, is there something you would like to add? Uh, no, Pam, you did an excellent job um, de describing the three stages of backward design and illustrating what your wonderful resource provides. I would like to make one comment. If you could scroll back to stage one. Yeah, and so you'll notice in the, the three horizontal bands, 
uh, on, on the screen are reflective of three categorically different related but not identical goal types. So at the top, we have transfer. What do we want students to be able to do with their learning in the long run? We have meaning, I'm gonna comment on that one. And then at the bottom, we have acquisition. What knowledge and skills should students acquire? Now back to the middle one, meaning. Here's, here's what we mean by that, because it's, it's not intuitively obvious perhaps. Grant Wiggins and I have long contended that understanding must be earned. Understanding must be earned by the learner, by the student. Understanding is made in the learner's mind. You just can't, I don't believe, tell a student a quote, big idea, and they're gonna immediately understand it. Um, here's an example. Correlation does not ensure causality. Everybody got that? Okay, we'll move on. That's not likely. That's a big abstract, but important idea. Correlation does not ensure causality. And so when we are teaching for understanding, when we're working to develop those big ideas, our goal in teaching is to facilitate meaning making. How do we do that? By having kids explore essential questions, try to apply their learning to something new, consider different points of view. Um, it's not just the teacher telling, it's the teacher facilitating meaning making by the student. And, and so that, that's a long uh, explanation for that single word, but I wanted to give the connotation and the, the intention there. That's great. Jay, do you have time for one more question? It's a quick uh, Always one. for you, of course, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, as you know, part of the focus for this webinar is on essential questions. Um, which oftentimes um, creating a, a good question is difficult for students. Essential questions um, are difficult for, for teachers without a lot of practice and, and support. What are some tips, let's say two to three tips you would give to educators when thinking about um, and creating essential questions? Yeah, it's a great question. And it, in my experience is developing good essential questions isn't easy. That's the bad news. The good news is you get better at it. And once you have an essential question, you got it. It's essential. It will outlive the standards, I pr predict, because standards are gonna shift and change and morph predictably. But if you have the essential questions, they're gonna be like the rudder of a sailboat. That, they're gonna keep you on, on uh, track, so to speak. Um, so, and by the way, one of my favorite questions, which I think is in your list, and there's some great ones that NLP has put in its framework. How do I know what to believe in what I read, hear, and view? And that's an essential question. And you can use that with young kids all the way up to adults. But, to, but more pointedly to your question, first of all, think about what you want students to really understand whether it's about misinformation or correlation that's not sure causality or what is evidence and how do you validate evidence? What does it mean to be skeptical? And, and if you can identify the big ideas, the concepts and processes that you want students to really understand, think then about questions that could evoke or connect to those big ideas. So that's, that's one approach. Um, secondly, the biggest challenge I've found is that teachers are so used to asking leading or guiding questions where they have a single answer in mind. You wanna to try to get questions that are intellectually open for which there's not a single correct answer. Uh, and and be, because essential questions have a different purpose. You're not looking for an answer. You're looking to stimulate thinking and deepen understanding and even engender discussion and debate. So make sure your questions are open-ended, not too closed. Um, two more quick tips. Um, this is a, a pattern that I've observed over the, my career. Often the best essential questions are short. What should we eat? When, if ever, should we fight? What makes writing worth reading? How do I know what to believe in X? What I've learned is the longer the question and literally in length, the more teacherly it tends to be. It tends to be more of a, 
a leading question. Again, that may be stylistic, but it's just something to be attentive to. The final thing is whenever possible, uh, generate ideas with, with a partner or a team, because it is a brainstorming process and get, just get your ideas out and then kind of work on them and refine them. And finally, you'll know when they work if they engage your students. And don't be afraid, even if you've spent time creating one, to adjust or modify it. And by the way, ask the students if they could suggest better versions of your questions. So those are my tips. Wow, awesome. Um, Pam, anything to add there? I know that was a huge list and I was <laughs> writing down, when, if ever, should we fight? That's my new favorite one, Jay. Thank you for sharing that one. I love it. When, if ever, should we fight? Pam, anything to add about tips for developing essential questions? I mean, Jay, Jay got to the heart of them. I, the only thing I can think to add would be just to make sure that you choose ones that are engaging for your group. Um, you know your students better than anyone else. And sometimes generic essential questions, right? You might need to tweak a little bit. Um, sometimes they're fine just a, as they are, but sometimes you want to choose one over another for a, a particular group. Thank you. And Jay, I know that you have to drop off in a little while, um, but I, I wanted to extend our thanks um, for you joining us tonight. Filled uh, my head, and I'm sure everyone who's joining us with valuable information and uh, a, a, a perfect way to spark um, that, that civic responsibility and the focus of national news literacy week in the fight against misinformation. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and sharing. My pleasure. I wish you well. And thanks to everyone who joined in. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for all your help, Jay. I'm going to switch this over uh, to, to Pam and Kim to lead the learning, but I do want to remind everyone we are giving away 10 of his books. Um, Jordan will share the winners at the end here, and we will follow up uh, with you for uh, email and uh, best shipping address, that sort of thing. So um, make sure that you uh, stay to the end. We have 10 books to give away from, from Jay, Jay McTie. So passing this over to Kim and Pam, thank you. Well, thank you, Shaylin. And I'm gonna be passing this over to Pam in just a moment, but when we were getting together and putting our heads together to talk about understanding by design and the new framework. I excitedly talked about essential questions as something that I, I think really is a great entry point into the conversation of curriculum design for news literacy. And so um, I, I think that this will be a really fruitful conversation to go over what are those characteristics of essential questions and be thinking about your classroom context and your students and what what questions will work for for your particular classroom. So Pam, let's go ahead and talk about what makes a question essential. All right, so I'm going to share with you some examples of essential and non essential questions and then I'm going to ask you to to um, write in the chat what you think are some common characteristics of these essential questions. Oh, yeah, <laughs> already got you already got it. Some of you. <laughs> All right, so essential questions. Here are some examples. What does it mean to be news literate? Why does news matter? In what ways do news and information shape society? What distinguishes facts from opinions? And why does the distinction matter for productive discourse? And what makes a piece of information credible? Right? These are all getting into news literacy, and these would be great for, for starting a unit on news literacy to, to share with your students. You could choose one, two, three, or all five. Right. And then these are some non-essential questions. What are the First Amendment freedoms? Who is Ida B. Wells? What are some different types of misinformation? Which country is ranked number one on one of the World Press Freedom Indexes? What is an example of motivated reasoning? So at this point, please add your, your response. What do you think are some common characteristics of essential questions? Oh, I like that one essential affect how I live my life. Okay. Ooh, definitely cross context, definitely open-ended. They allow for choice. I'm seeing open-ended a few times. Great. 
Oh, yes. Wow, they're, they're, they're so fast. <laughs> Thought provoking, <laughs> engaging, leads to discussion. Great. Oh, you're so right. Several right answers for sure. And require contemplation, right? You can't get it immediately as Jace deeper thinking for sure. They're requiring you to, to get to your higher level thinking skills. You have to have the, the knowledge from these non-essential questions. You have to have that just basic knowledge to support your answer for the essential questions. They could change your mind. Nice. These are great responses. All right. So let's, I think you, you got all of these characteristics of essential questions. There are no straightforward right answers. They provoke and sustain inquiry. They often address big ideas, concepts, and foundations. They raise more questions and benefit from being asked again and again. Um, and that's crucial, right? Because if in a, a good unit plan or a good curriculum, you're going to be spiraling. You're going to be touching on the same issue multiple times, going deeper um, in each instance. So they're not leading students to a predetermined focus, but instead a deeper understanding. And I, yes, I, you're all, you are all really just nailing this in the chat. I wish you were all my students. Well, no, no, I'm not teaching anymore. But if I were still teaching, I would wish you were all my students. <laughs> um, Right. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about today, Pam, since you were really integral in creating the framework for news literacy teaching, uh, I wanted to hear about your process for writing these essential questions. And, and as Jay said, essential questions are not always easy to write. So if you could talk a little bit about that process that you went through. Oh, I, that is a really great question. Um, because as Jay said, they were not easy <laughs> to write. And they, they went through multiple iterations and it wasn't just me who wrote them. I brainstormed maybe 12 on my own and I, I brainstormed my initial ones from our standards, right? I looked at our standards, I said, what is it I want students to, to wonder about? And then um, I, I brainstormed a, a few questions for each of our standards and, and tried to make sure that they were open-ended, intriguing, no one right answer and um, not bleeding. So I, I came up with my list and then I brought it to my education team and, and John Silva had already brainstormed some in a, a previous uh, work on this, this project and Peter Adams, head of the education team, he also gave feedback and my, my colleague, Hannah Covington, she also took a look at them and then I brought it to Kim. <laughs> and so everyone played a role and added and tweaked and then of course we, we brought it to Jay who tweaked it again. So um, it's really, really difficult to create essential questions on your own. Uh, there's no way around it. I, just like with, with good writing, you need critique partners. You are creating something from nothing. Um, and when you're doing that, you need input. Um, so I, I guess my, my biggest piece of advice when writing those essential questions is yes, have your, your goal in mind, have your vision, but get input from people you trust who also are um, knowledgeable about the topic. I definitely remember writing essential questions collaboratively every time. I worked as a middle school social studies teacher and often would be in a, a group of people workshopping those. So I definitely wanna echo that. Were any of the essential questions on this list especially challenging to, to get to the heart of for you? Um, there was one, and it, and it was about, which one was it? It was the, um, the, why is it important to distinguish between facts and opinions was our first one. I knew I wanted a question about facts and opinions because we, we know that students and, and our, our public in general um, have, have difficulty at times distinguishing what is fact as opinion and, and seeing an opinion piece and thinking it's a straight news article, right? So we know that that's a, a skill we need to, to address, but what is the question that, that's gonna get them thinking and acting on that? And so originally we wrote, why is it important to distinguish between facts and opinions? But that was um, guiding them to our, um, our response, right? So we change it to what distinguishes facts from opinions and why does the distinct, distinction matter for productive discourse? So it, it became longer, but it was also more open-ended. Um, that one was hard. To, to nail down. Sounds like you're wrestling with that like teacherly question that Jay yeah. was talking about earlier. Like, how do I open it up more and have it be that kind of question that leads to other questions? 
are any of the questions on this list uh, especially um, like favorites of yours? Do you do you have any that are your favorite questions that you wrote that you wish you were back in the classroom to dig into? I think my favorite would be why does news matter? Because um, it get it, this is going to be personal though, right? For for every one of you, it um, you're going to choose the one or the ones that really speak to you. For me, why does news matter? It gets to my intrinsic need to as a I'm a social studies teacher, ELA teacher, right? <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm that humanities person as well, even though I never taught technically humanities, I either taught ELA or, or social studies. It, it gets to that combined value of both civics education, as well as the reading, writing, listening, speaking elements of news literacy. And, but that's, a, again, that's a personal interest. I think my favorite has to be also how can we know what to believe it's, it's partly I feel like the X files uh, fan in me, but also because it's just so rich for all the grade levels, I think. Um, that to go in there and, and dig into and unpack how do how can we know what to believe what makes a piece of information credible. Um, that really speaks to the, the social studies educator in me. <laughs> Um, is there anything else about the process of creating these essential question, questions that you wanted to touch on before we head into some tips for writing them? Um, just again, to make sure you're using what fits your classroom most appropriately. That's, that's not only what will intrigue your students, but also what intrigues you as a teacher. Um, I know once I, I chose a novel because I thought I need to do this. It has this type of character. My kids will love it, but I didn't love the book. And it showed, right? Like you're gonna to want to choose those those questions that really interest you because you're gonna be visiting them again and again with the kids. So you want to make sure you are also interested in, in the questions you choose. That's a really great point. Here's another uh, few tips to keep in mind for writing essential questions. I included the first couple of tips here. Um, as a former middle school social studies teacher, I worked a lot with sixth grade students and so writing in kid friendly language for my essential questions was super important. I feel like when you have an essential question that's in kid friendly language, it really can hook your students and get them excited about the content right away and get them asking more questions and ready to do that investigation that exploration with you. So if you end up writing something that's more high level, uses big words, but you're teaching with younger students, see if there's a way that you can make it more kid friendly, make it appropriate to your grade level, uh, lexile levels, and really bring them into the conversation right off the bat. And the second tip that I put in here is uh, fewer essential questions mean more time to explore and unpack. I, like a lot of educators, have worked with pre-service teachers and student teachers, and I think the first thing that I often see is that on their lesson plans and unit plans, there's a long list of essential questions. And so my advice is usually when I see those long lists is what's at the heart of this lesson? What's at the heart of that unit that you really want to be exploring with your students and unpacking? Um, because the, if you compare that list down to what you're really interested in, you really get much more time with your students to do that investigation and that exploration. And I think that kind of brings us to tip three. Would you like to talk a little bit about that one, Pam? Sure, right. Some of you I had seen in the chat had already talked, had already pointed out that really good quality essential questions can transfer across disciplines. So if you're talking about um, finding logical fallacies in English language arts, you can find them in history class. You can find them in data um, that is misrepresented in, in science or math, right? So um, these type, these good quality essential questions are not um, super specific, right? Um, yeah, and, I, and talking about science, I see some people chatting, which is awesome that you're helping each other out there. Um, I just want to let you know, we are coming out with a couple of science lessons by the end of the year on um, science misinformation and medical misinformation. So keep it, keep your eyes out for that. They, they are on their way. 
Pam, that's a, a great um, point. And I just want to add real quickly in here, um, there was a request for the slides. And so we did add them to the link tree. So the, a PDF version of the slides, Jordan quickly put them in there just so everyone is aware um, that you can grab those. Perfect. Thanks, Shaylin. Any other tips for writing essential questions, Pam, before we, we give everyone a chance to digest some of this? I don't, I don't think so. I think when if you're just starting out, I, I really do think if you're just starting out, you should use ones that you know we created or, or that are, are vetted until you have some experience with them. But once you do, I think it's, it's good to branch out to start thinking about writing your own and then, of course, just getting that feedback. If you've worked with essential questions, written essential questions with your team, go ahead and pop into the chat if you have any tips or advice for anyone here today. And we're going to transition over to the next part of our not not thank you yet. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to transition over now to a moment of reflection for you all, because I know we've talked a, about a lot of different tips. We've gone over a lot of characteristics of essential questions. Um, talked about the big picture of understanding by design framework. So I wanted to pause and give you all time to take a look at this shared Google Doc. We're going to pop it into the chat, a link for you that gives you editing access to this document. And I have a question focus up there at the top. And that question focus is meant to prompt you into thinking about news literacy and see what questions come up for you today. So the question focus is information is the basis for civic literacy, agency, and action. Today's students are facing the most challenging information landscape in history. When you think about that question focus, what questions come up for you? And again, you have editing access. You can start typing in those questions right there below the question focus. And I'm going to pause here and give you all, put a timer on for two minutes be thinking about your classroom, your students, your curriculum, and see what comes up with you, up for you today. And I will put the slide back on for the characteristics of essential questions in case that's helpful. But right now, I'm just gonna go quiet for a couple minutes and then pop back in and see where we're at with our list.
Okay, that is our two minutes. So let's check in on our shared Google Doc and see what you all what surfaced for you all for questions relating to that question focus. I see a split sort of between um, some essential questions and some questions about that process of teaching news literacy. So I think these are great starting place to really dig into some of these topics. What I'd like you to do now is taking a look at all the different questions that surfaced here. Put an asterisk next to one or two that really stood out to you or resonated with you. Or maybe you think they're gonna really resonate with your curriculum or with your students. Take a look, take a moment to look through that list and put an asterisk next to one or two that really resonate with you. And if anyone would like to share in the chat or um, raise your hand so we can unmute you, if you would love to, if you'd like to talk a little bit about which one you put an asterisk next, next to and why, we'd love to hear from you. And Jordan, if you see any raised hands, please go ahead and let anyone jump in. Will do. And my other panelists, are any of the questions really resonating with you today? Tons of them, Kim, I'm typing them in the chat right now. There are so many wonderful ones, maybe to create a forum post and put on new Newslet Nation. Um, I really love how reliable are primary sources and do all students have equitable access to information? Hmm. Yes. I think that's great. We're also, I'm also seeing some about um, teaching news literacy and what that's like to, to work with the communities that you're in and work with parents. We have a few resources that I think would be helpful to maybe pop into the link tree on teaching news literacy in all different types of contexts. So maybe we can also include that or put that into the News Lit Nation post. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a wonderful. Sorry, you first, Shaylin. Oh, sorry, that was me. I just said that I'll pop the link for the infographic on uh, teaching news literacy in polarizing times, which I think addresses a lot of the questions present in this document into the link tree, and then I'll post the link again in the chat. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, that that would be a, a great way to address the question that I was really interested in. And and just like Shaylin, there are so many. It's super hard to choose like just one or two. But the one that I'm really intrigued in, how in the world can teachers convince parents that we are not trying to politically indoctrinate students just because we are exploring media literacy? Yeah, because we are in polarizing times, right? And it's not just students who, needs new, who need news literacy, it is also our public. Pam, mm -hmm. I zeroed in on that one too. I thought this is perfect, um, you know, to shorten it, is news literacy in critical thinking skills political? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So we, you all have access to this Google Docs. So if there are any questions that you wanna bring back to your classroom, please feel free to take some inspiration from the, the group brainstorm today. And I'm going to uh, head back over to our framework for teaching news literacy to do uh, kind of round out our webinar today by talking a little bit about stage three. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end, so keep those questions in mind if you have any that, that have come up for you over the course of our webinar today. Before I jump into some stage three discussion, I wanted to say two things right up front. One is that I'm going to be checking into some of the resources that I share with you all today through the framework itself, so we do have the links in the framework. But you can also access a lot of these resources through the link tree that Jordan has popped into the chat today. So those are two places that you can kind of follow along. The second thing to be aware of is that um, the resources I'll be sharing with you all are free. So just keep that in mind. So I'm going to scroll down 
all the way to stage three, planning that those learning experiences. And as we mentioned before, this stage is really all about the 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 doing in the classroom. What is what is what are your students students up to to help them unpack and explore those essential questions that you've set up. And as Pam mentioned, we have lots of learning events here listed below that to give you ideas about what to do in your classroom. So I wanted to give you all a quick sense of what is available here. First, we have Checkology lessons, including info zones, what is news, branded content. There's a collection of 14 Checkology lessons here, and you can see the learning objectives listed below them, as well as supplemental activities that are related to those. And if you click on the links here, they'll be taking you to the lesson guides that give you more background information on those lessons. If you are new to Checkology, I did want to take a moment to let you know that Checkology is News Literacy Project's flagship program for teaching news literacy. And it's browser based and can work on any device. And you have that, the option to explore those 14 lessons. Um, and those lessons have assessment questions embedded within them to check for student understanding. They also have uh, subject matter expert hosts to go through the content with students. And we have dozens of challenges, exercises, and missions in there that relate to these lessons and provide opportunities for students to practice and extend their learning. We also, in Checkology, have a word wall that uh, is a great resource for vocab building. So if you'd like to bring your students to their word wall and student accounts, or this is the educator account perspective, you'll be able to click into words and see those definitions. So on my Checkology dashboard here, this is my educator account. I also wanted to point out another resource that's also in the framework, which is the newsroom to classroom program. And that newsroom to classroom program is embedded right within your Checkology educator account in the journalist tab here. And the newsroom to classroom program is a is a program designed to allow you access to invite journalist volunteers into your classroom for an in person or virtual connection. And you can filter by and search by different criteria if you're looking for a specific journalist or someone in your area, you can use those criteria to filter and search. Once you find a journalist that you're interested in, you can click on their profile. Uh, get to know a little bit about their work experience and background, their areas of expertise, and you can invite them into your class for a virtual or in-person connection and write them a message and the invitation. And they'll get back to you via the email address that you enter here. And then you just click that green send invitation button and they will get back to you and hopefully be in your classroom soon to discuss a news literacy topic with your students. So I'm going to head back to the framework and I'm going to scroll down past those Checkology lessons to show you where that newsroom to classroom link was. All right, here we are at newsroom to classroom. Other lesson, other resources to be aware of that are outside of Checkology, one of them that I want to highlight today is the SIFT. The SIFT is a free weekly newsletter for educators. It's got recent me media news as well as timely examples of misinformation. You can often find great bell ringers and exit tickets and discussion questions, lots of classroom ready content embedded within the SIFT. So if you're not yet uh, subscribed to it, go ahead and subscribe to the SIFT to get that right in your inbox weekly during the school year. And there's also a bunch of issues in the back catalog if you'd like to go through and see what are some of the recent SIFT issues, what do they look like, what have they contained, what kind of discussion questions can they bring to your classroom. A couple of other resources that are related to the SIFT that sort of started in the SIFT, you'll often see them appear in SIFT issues, um, but you can also access elsewhere. One of them is News Goggles, which you can find in our resources library. News Goggles is a, a feature that our colleague Hannah um, does short interviews with journalists and reporters. So if you are unable to set aside a class period for having a journalist visit your classroom, you can always check out some of the videos that Hannah has done discussing news literacy topics with journalists 
Hannah in this video discusses the topic of newsworthiness with a reporter who covers climate and the environment. So these are about 10 to 15 minute long conversations and would be a great way to bring that presence of the, the journalist and have uh, them talk about their careers without actually uh, setting aside a whole class period for a classroom connection if you're unable to make that commitment. Another resource that spun out of the SIFT is the Viral Rumor Rundown. The Viral Rumor Rundown is, uh, I like to think of it as fact checks with teachable moments embedded within them. So here you can explore different topics, uh, but I'm just gonna click on one of our recent ones, which is this fake CNBC headline. You can see the, the uh, viral rumor here with the fake headline. Below it is the fact check information. And then those teachable moments down here. How can we talk about this in the classroom in a way that's going to help my students learn new news literacy skills? What kind of information can we glean from this that we can bring to the classroom? So that viral rumor rundown blog is a great way to check out what are the latest viral rumors out there and how can we talk about those with students. All right, I know we are getting close to our time and I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Shaylin for that question time. But if you would like to share any resources that you're excited about using in your classroom that you think will help you unpack those essential questions, please go ahead and pop those into the chat. Or if you're familiar with some of these resources and you wanna give them a shout out. And I know people have been sharing um, so many resources. So many educators have been sharing their thoughts from their students. This is fantastic. Jordan keeps relinking um, the link tree, which has resources that we've shared tonight. She continues to add them. Anything you wanna add real quick, Jordan, before we uh, tap into those questions about all of this sharing in the chat? Nope, I'm just excited to hear the answer to Martina's question in the Q&A. Great, so one question, and we wanna make sure that we hit um, the book giveaway at the end. So the question is this from Martina. Social media is a big concern. How can we create science content that fits the growing demands of the youth for accurate science when we are comparing, are competing with all of the misinformation on social media? This is a great question. When I was actually thinking about today, I was looking at some recent news about um, science experts and science communicators on social media. And I think bringing students into the conversation about how, like, whether or not experts should be on social media talking and communicating about the fields of their expertise, that might be a great entry point to having some of those conversations about science and information versus science and misinformation in some of the spaces that our students frequent the most. Yeah, that's great. I know Pam's going to add some stuff, but I do want to give a shout out to our colleague, Peter Adams, who is in the chat right now sharing um, resources that will also support that question. So be sure to check out what Peter's sharing. Um, Pam, what would you add to this? Oh, I just wanted to add one person on TikTok for your for your students who are in high schoolers who are in high school and middle school who probably are on TikTok. Um, Dr. Kat is fantastic. Dr. Katrine Wallace, um, she goes on TikTok and debunks a whole bunch of science misinformation. So she's definitely one to put on your radar. Um, and there will be other there, there are others as well, but um, obviously go to, to teach your students to go to you know real medical. <laughs> science as opposed to just this random, like, oh, it's a meme, it must be real. Yeah, that's great. And I know um, Peter shared a webinar and um, Angela said, I attended that news media bias webinar mentioned by Peter and it was excellent. So check out that webinar um, and also uh, knowing that if you have that gut check, at the beginning, even though someone claims that they are a doctor or a scientist, um, a quick uh, looking for the mis and disinformation red flags along with a lateral reading and checks um, will help you uh, combat that misinformation because it is out there all over. I know my own son shares that as well. Um, let me see if there's another question. I see one more in here. Um, as a scientist, I need data of students understanding 
of the NLP exercises and lessons. Is there a way to view grades performance within each lesson? And I'm gonna pass this to Kim and Jordan. Is there a way to view grades and performance within each lesson? Um, speaking of checkology, so then uh, uh, claims can be made about student learning. That's a great question. So when you're in the Checkology Educator account, you'll be able to click on the evaluate assignments area to to view each assignment by each uh, student response by their assignment. Um, and we do have some exciting updates coming soon. Uh, so we'll we'll be sure to keep those and um, be sure to communicate about those soon. But uh, in the meantime, I wanted to just also give a shout out to the Checkology Help Center, where we have lots of different Help Center articles on how to check out your student work on Checkology. And I'm always at the other end of that Checkology Help Center or Jordan, and we're happy to help answer those questions you might have. Great. Anything to add, Jordan, about um, student data, progress, formative assessment, pre-post assessment, anything you would like to add? Luckily, it's all there in that help center link that is in the chat. Um, so just get in touch with us if you've got any further questions about that. That's great. I know I want to give Pam this last word, but before she she kind of wraps up um, the framework and, and her excitement um, for this new tool uh, to add to your resource, um, I do want Jordan to go ahead and share um, the winners of the book. We will communicate with you offline to find the best um, way to send this to you, but we definitely wanted to share um, Jay McTie and of course his colleague Grant Wiggins and their wonderful work. So Jordan, um, if you wanna paste in the names of those people who attended live and won the books, we will contact you and uh, reach out and find the best mailing address. Um, thank you so much for joining and I'm gonna pass this over to, to Pam for the last word. Yes, congratulations to our winners, but thank you all and congratulations all for, for joining and, and getting new information. I know that's kind of a letdown, isn't it? <laughs> but, but I really am so grateful that you joined us today and I, I hope you enjoyed it. If you find that you are using any of our resources and enjoy them, please let us know. It always makes us feel good. And uh, if there's anything you, you think we could do better, you know, let us know that too, because we're always looking to improve. Thank you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the week for National News Literacy Week. If you uh, are burning to learn more with us and from us, we do have the, the National News Lit Camp tomorrow, um, which is running basically all day long for you to join in and learn for, from students, journalists in the field and other um, NLP colleagues of ours, make sure to register for that. Otherwise, thank you so much, Pam. I know that you have poured your uh, heart and soul into this framework and it is um, so valuable for those who want to teach news literacy in the classroom. So thank you all and uh, have a great night.